Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I'm doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. I'm here. Yeah, I I see that. <laughs> we made it. We're doing the podcast. Yeah, well, it was, it was in question last. It week. was. It, that's true. Um, something was going to get done. I don't know how good a podcast is going to be because I had a super busy week too. Dude, I, yeah, I don't. I didn't get to do a whole lot. Yeah. So in the way of, I mean, it doesn't seem like there's a lot going on right now. I mean, I did watch the news yesterday. I didn't see anything yeah. that was like, oh, that's something we got to talk about. So, I mean, there's that. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, for those who don't know, my actual job <laughs> yeah. um, is in property insurance. So, so there's a lot of ec- there's a lot of economic stimulus going on oh, in right. Florida yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. There was a, <laughs> like, there's that. Not enough, obviously. <laughs> Not enough for you, right? <laughs> yeah, but this thing's a delayed reaction deal. Like, yeah. you won't you won't see the business from from that disaster for weeks, probably. Yeah, Milton will trickle in at the beginning, and then. Yeah. overload probably <laughs> yeah dude like i really oh. feel for those people down there um i was seeing some video the other day of like they had just like of houses they had just like got the sheetrock back in mm-hmm. and like it's all over again yeah like, well we we have clients in georgia and north carolina too so we've been doing debbie stuff and i got you um and that's that's starting to really roll yeah <laughs> this week it was starting to really roll so yeah. Um. Anyway. <coughs> yeah. That hadn't had a lot of hadn't had a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> time, def- time is at a premium right I, now. I definitely get it. Um. Everything turned out all right. Your things. Yeah. 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 Wife's doing good. Yeah. So. Actually, I sent her a message yesterday asking oh, did how you? she was doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, she's doing good. So. All right. Well, that worked. Or else I wouldn't be here. <laughs> well, that's yeah, good point. So. Um, we we were just discussing the uh, the phenomenon of video games that simulate actual work. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't I don't know that I fully understand it, but my, my daughter plays one that's a uh, uh, what is it? a pe- pressure washing game where like you just go around the house and pressure wash. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. She's she's always like, you got to get every little spot because any spot you miss, you have to go back and find it. So it's better to get it immediately. Oh, it's like, yeah. Okay. Like, <laughs> I understand that concept. Yeah. But <laughs> Life lesson here. You want to try it outside? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'll inspect when you're done. <laughs> yeah. hmm. So Has that worked yet? It has not worked yet. No. So, I, mean, I have a power washer here, too. She can come over here. <laughs> yeah. You have a power washer in the house, right? Yep. <laughs> Sure do. There's plenty of things that could be power washed. I'll give her real money too. <laughs> right? <laughs> you think that <laughs> she, would make an impact? She, she does a good job. Yeah. Well, she's got plenty of practice in the simulators. So. Well, that's that's good to know. That's that's good. I was mm-hmm. I, I saw one that was like a lawnmower simulator. Yeah. They just, like went around and just mowed the grass. <laughs> that is just wild. To me. <laughs> just like, like why? You, yeah. If you need a yard to do that with, like. Have mine. I have one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't. So. Yeah, I don't understand these things. Um, it always seemed to me that games were for stuff that you couldn't actually just do. Yeah, exactly. In real life, <laughs> like go fight in a war. Yeah, it's like I don't want a jogging simulator. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> if I want the experience of jogging, I should probably just like go jogging. I don't know. The Wii Fit has some pretty fun games that w- that definitely simulated doing the well, yeah, poorly. I mean, you, you remember how bowling used to end up? You didn't. Oh, yeah. You didn't actually like. At the beginning, you started off. You did the bowling thing, and then pretty soon it would sit on the couch and flick your wrist. Yeah, yeah. I learned like if you, <laughs> if you hold the trigger and point it upside down and throw it at the TV, mm-hmm. it, it works very effectively. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, uh, oh well. Um, what was the one that uh, actually um, oh, tracked your body movements? The Kinect. Yeah. That was the, the Xbox had that one. Couldn't cheat that one as well. Yeah, and that one was fun. I enjoyed the Kinect. Yeah, I didn't I didn't get to play with that very much. And you know, it is strange because 
Like the new systems don't really have any. I guess the v- VR would be the equivalent to that now. Yeah. I, I, I've <laughs> never done the VR. but I've seen plenty of videos online of people doing VR and like running into things in their house and breaking <laughs> stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that makes me laugh. I like the idea of that. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody uh, uh, like, you know, running <laughs> away from a monster or whatever in their VR and crashing <laughs> over their TV stand. Right. It's funny. Yeah. Definitely got to clear the, the, the play space. <laughs> yeah. I'm entertained by that. I, Right. <laughs> uh, well, um, all things considered, I thought that we would just talk about libertarianism. Okay. Because we like haven't that. in a while. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we try to employ the ideas of libertarianism or apply them to what we're talking about all the time. But just like, yeah. like in a pure form, like what is libertarianism? Yeah. Okay. And I guess I, I thought that we would do it just like from a pure philosophical standpoint and also from like a an actual like applied politics or yeah. government kind of idea. Okay. And hopefully that'll take up some time because I don't really have anything else to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could actually talk about a little some more stuff. I thought um, I saw some things that were worth commenting on and then I went l- looking for clips today and. I couldn't find them and I couldn't remember exactly what was said and don't like misquoting very much. And yeah. So what's, yeah. I mean, has anything happened this week as far as Israel is concerned? Uh, Netanyahu talked to Biden. Okay. I did hear about that. And so I did and hear they, about that. They have formulated a plan about it, how to respond to <laughs> Iran's yeah. and it unprovoked did, attack on Israel. It did irritate <laughs> me when I heard that because it's like, man, like we'll, we'll be really quick to talk to our allies, mm-hmm. but the, the other side, we won't even have a conversation with before we start sending over the bombs. Yeah. Yeah. We don't believe in diplomacy anymore in this country. Oh, it's really irritating. I, I don't know. I, I um I was thinking about you know, like back to that um idea of well I mean really essentially of mutually assured destruction and how we've forgotten about the dangers of nuclear war it seems yeah um and I, I heard somebody talk I want to say it was Mark Milley but I don't remember anyway talking about you know the the peace that we've had since the end of World War II, um, enforced by the uh, New World Order. Wait, no, that's not what he called it. Uh, <laughs> the um, the rules based uh, international order. order. Yeah, that's what they yeah. always say. Yep. And how it's been such a peaceful period since then, the last 80 years. What? What are you by, talking about? Uh, by what definition has it been peaceful? Yeah, and he he was saying it was because of the enforcement of the international, ba- whoever this was, it might not have been Millie, yeah. um, but the enforcement of the international rules based order um, has uh, meant that there's been no great power p- conflict in the last eighty years. And I was like, no, that's just a lie. <laughs> First off, there's been plenty of great power conflict. It's just been through proxies: yeah. Korea, Vietnam. I mean, the Cold War, it wasn't an active war. So there hasn't been entirely active war between the great powers. But the great powers have been fighting this whole time. They've just been fighting through other countries. Through proxies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ukraine's a prime example of that. I mean, that's. Mm -hmm. I think Ukraine would be the most recent example of that. Yeah, oh yeah. But I mean, it's, I mean, Vietnam, like, Mm -hmm. I mean, this has been going on. Exactly. Um, And the other thing is that it's not the formation of the international rules-based order in the UN that has kept what little peace there's been. That's not what's been keeping the peace between the great powers in that time. It's the fear of nuclear holocaust that's been keeping the peace between the great powers during that time. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that makes nothing but sense. (laughs) But for whatever reason, we've decided (laughs) that that's no longer a threat uh, unless Iran gets them. Yeah, yeah, of course. If Iran gets them, the whole world will change. Yeah, well, um, and that's and they're only weeks away. <laughs> only weeks away, and they have been for twenty years. For twenty, yeah, I was gonna say I, Netanyahu and the little like bomb. Where oh you, yeah, like, this little uh, cartoon <laughs> bomb. Cartoon bomb. That, oh man, you know, it's almost to the top. <laughs> that that guy is almost a parody of himself. Yeah. He, uh, I, I really despise Netanyahu, but Netanyahu's in a weird position because his political future 
is dependent on him maintaining conflict. Yeah, and he's doing a good job of it. Yeah, he is. Um, and so, now think about this. Israel is now involved in what they call a seven-front war. Wow, is it really that many fronts? Not really. I mean, I, I would say that it's not. But, okay. you know, they're bombing, uh, they're bombing Gaza, they're bombing Lebanon, they're bombing Syria. Okay. Um, they're bombing Yemen. Yeah. Actually, we're bombing Yemen on their behalf. For them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, they are fighting in the West Bank, which really means that they're throw, going in and throwing people off their property. Yeah. Um, that they are refugees in because they were already thrown off their property. I, I should <laughs> yeah. probably qualify that. Um, <coughs> Iran. Yep. What's the seventh? I don't even know what the seventh front is. Maybe know. they think they're fighting Egypt too. Ah, who knows? <laughs> they're always there, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the other border. Yeah. Maybe they think they're fighting Jordan. I think, I'd, are they fighting Jordan? No. Okay. I don't, I mean, know. But I mean, I don't know. There's a huge population of Palestinians in Jordan though. So maybe. Yeah. But the, the maybe they just consider it a threat. Maybe the, the Jordanian government, yeah. <clears throat> backs up Israel every step. Yeah. They have to do it carefully though, because roughly because half their population is Palestinian. Palestinian yeah. Um, also refugees. Yeah. They got kicked off their property. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and we're supporting this. And this is the thing is once again, this idea, if they didn't have the backing and the protection of the United States, if the United States wasn't giving them money, weapons and protection they couldn't do this. Mm -mm. They couldn't create a mess of this. And I, I you know, just to kind of um, talk again about, well, for example, um, Netanyahu delivered messages to Iran and he delivered a message to Lebanon. All right. A message to Iran, a message to, to the people of Lebanon, to the people of Iran urging them to overthrow their government, which isn't going to happen. By the but, way, in English too, by the well, way. Well, that's what I was going to point out. Yeah. He delivered those messages in English. Yeah. Because it wasn't for the people of Iran or Lebanon. No, it's for us. It's for the Americans. Yep. I mean, and it has to be because we're, we're, we're propping all of that up. Yeah. Um, he wouldn't be able to make those threats and those things if we weren't doing what we're doing. So, um, I don't know, the whole thing's stupid, well, but it, it does kind of reflect like the, what we were talking about last week, um, the reports coming out that while publicly the administration is telling Netanyahu to stop doing what he's doing privately, they're urging him on. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the, in some ways, this is a relief to me. Yeah. <laughs> because um, the idea that that this country that we are completely supporting and protecting would ignore what the president is telling them to do is frustrating. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like if you have somebody working for you that doesn't do what you tell them. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> yeah. truth be told, I don't know that it matters one way or the other, because even if we weren't giving the, pulling the strings behind the scenes, I don't think we have any control over Israel. Uh, I mean, we do is if we pull the funding. Yeah, or but, the weaponry. But I mean, that, but that's how not, long but could that's they, not happening though. These like, wars are completely dependent on our weapons. One hundred percent. If we stop, uh, I mean, one call from the White House to the Pentagon say stop those shipments. Yeah, but this couldn't go on for maybe a couple more days. Agreed. One hundred percent agree. But at the same time, you've got to consider what would the political repercussions be from that. And that's what Netanyahu knows, is that, that, yeah, we could make that call and shut them down immediately, but we would em but then you would have the American populace to deal with, and, and he knows that. Well, I'm not convinced that the American populace would be that upset about us stopping our support of Israel. It would depend on the messenger. You need the right well, president and the right person that can go out there and make the argument as for why. And the argument ain't hard to make, especially right now. Yeah. Because 
with what's going on in Florida and North Carolina and all of these George, all of these places mm-hmm. that's been ravaged by these storms right now, people are upset about the money that's going to other countries right now when we we're not taking care of our own people. Yeah, when we just agreed to send eight billion dollars to Ukraine and eight billion dollars to uh, Israel. Yeah, and that's not lost on people. That, those those are two separate eight billion dollar packages, by the way. Just to be clear, that's not yeah eight billion dollars in total. That's eight billion dollars each yeah that's 16 total Mm -hmm. (laughs) um so and and that's not lost on people that we're sending this amount of money to these other countries and the the response to these hurricanes has been atrocious well (laughs) that's a separate problem Um, i agree that that's a problem of people expecting the government to help them i I think that i think the real mistake there is (laughs) people's reliance on government aid like because uh, the government isn't equipped they they're not really capable of doing anything positive i well i agree with that <laughs> but it is it's it's some it's horrible to know that we have a government the size with the size and scope that our government does that, and how much money they take from all of us how much money they take and and that they're giving it to these other countries i mean if let's just say you took that same 16 billion dollars and was like, we're going to put all of that into hurricane relief and to, to um, climate disasters in general. Mm-hmm. I mean, you would have, you could have massive response teams going into these areas and just like, and I'm <laughs> not saying that it would <laughs> no, necessarily. No, no. See, this is what would happen is if they said, we are going to put this much money into, um, you know, disaster relief and uh, support for climate disasters that money would actually not rather than going to people would be going to researchers to figure out how to prevent the climate disasters. <laughs> yeah. You're not wrong about that. And various programs to screw up our environment in the attempt to take control of the climate change. Yeah. That's what would happen. And well, this is what I mean by the government is incapable of doing anything positive. Yeah. Well, it, once again, though, it all goes back to who's pulling the levers. Um, I mean, you're right. Like you, you turn the government loose with that much money and, and don't give them a whole lot of scope of how to use it. That's what you're going to end up with. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's no reason a country with that takes as much money from its citizens as this one does, um, shouldn't have some kind of like good response when something like this happens. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's like FEMA is a joke and it, it shouldn't be like, I mean, when it, when <laughs> When the when something like this happens, we ought to have a response team that can co- go in and start shipping in resources and things that people need, like immediately after the storm. Like, there's no reason we couldn't do that, but we don't. And and like you say, we never will because government is in its nature in, incapable. Yeah. Um, well, what what you need is to get government out of the way. Yeah. Um, FEMA just needs to get out of the way. Stop funding FEMA, get FEMA out of the way, yeah. put that money aside to go into community organizations and so forth when these things happen, because yeah. that's who's really going to help you. Well, and, and at the end of the day, that would be, that would be the way to handle it is if you feedered that money into to organizations that were committed to doing the right thing. I mean, I don't think it'd be perfect, but I think it would be yeah. better than it would be because it would go to a, like the American Red Cross that spends you know an obscene amount of its money on advertising instead of what it's yeah. supposed to be doing and things. But I mean, but, but that would be better than government, though. That's what I was fixing to say. It would be better than the alternative. Mm-hmm. So, and at least they would have to compete, I suppose. The problem is that even if if it was market based, then yes. The problem is that even if that money is being fed through the government into these organizations, then you're still f- feeding corruption. Really, yeah. Um, you're not. It's not a competitive environment in the sense of whoever's doing the best job gets the most money. It's a competitive environment in the sense that whoever lobbies the best gets the most money. Exactly. Exactly. So I don't know. It is atrocious, though, that that we don't. You would think that a country like ours would want to have a response team that that the world looked at as an example. Yeah. And and dude, we're far from it. Mm-hmm. I mean, far far from it. So, I mean, I don't know what country has a better one, but I know that what I what we've seen from these two storms is not it. Well, I mean, from what I've seen the thing the things that have been most effective is like um groups of uh veterans and so forth that have gotten together and go in and rescue people. <coughs> 
Yeah. Like on their own. Yeah. Of their own volition. Cajun Navy. Yeah, that yeah. exactly, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, that's been the most effective help for people. They're just not big enough. But think about how many more of those organizations there might be if all that money wasn't sucked up by the government. Yeah. Oh, um, you're not wrong. And also the uh, resources that would be available to them if FEMA wasn't sitting on all the airfields. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, with, or actively not letting people go through. <laughs> yeah, uh, with tons of resources that, um, that should be can't. delivered, but they can't. Or exactly. Or don't, or yeah. whatever. Whatever the case is, it's yeah. not happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's unfortunate. But, uh, you know, once again, government's the problem. See, that stuff's good, isn't it? It's very good. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm digging it. Yeah. So, so um I almost hate to mention these actual brands on the podcast since nobody gives us any money. <laughs> ah. But um, I was able to pick up a uh, Ridgemont Reserve or 1792 full proof bottle. Um, 125 proof, 1792 bourbon. Yeah. It's great. It's got, <laughs> oh, man, it's got so much flavor. Yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's really um, good. And I'm um, going through it fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luckily, 125 proof makes you, you know, slow down a little. But, <laughs> but only mildly. <laughs> yeah, only, only a little. <laughs> only if you got somewhere to drive later. <laughs> and I would never drink it if I had somewhere to drive later. Exactly. So yeah. that, that's for homebody nights. Yeah. And I got plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay. So, and then that's, that's I guess, kind of the point. Um is that, uh, all right, so the libertarian idea is is centered around self-ownership, right? Like, that's that's kind of the starting point in terms of philosophy, um, is that you own yourself. You want to talk about abortion tonight? Abortion just feels like such a great example to use to it. explore this, because it's kind of murky, too. Like, it's, it's definitely gray. Yeah. Um, but it, it makes it, <laughs> it's an interesting topic to try and apply these principles to. I think it helps well, illustrate a lot. It is, but it, because I mean, this is this is one that libertarians are are split on. There's yeah. a few, and this is a big one. Yeah. The other one I would say is immigration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, like those, to me at least, those are the two big ones that that there's just not really a consensus amongst libertarians as far as what's right and wrong mm -hmm. or which side of the fence they're on. Yeah. I mean, there's a consensus about what's right and wrong. There's just a, a yeah. disagreement about definitions. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, starting with self-ownership like that, and it's a, it's a moral philosophy taken outside of government. It's moral philosophy inside of government too, but yeah. Anyway, um, it, it, essentially the idea is that there's no person who has greater moral authority over you than you. Yeah. All right. Um, and then everything that you're able to acquire without impinging on somebody else's self-ownership, essentially, um, starts to fall under. That's where you get the property rights from. Property rights are really important yeah. uh, to a libertarian. So um, ownership is key, and it starts with self-ownership, and then it's what you're able to take ownership of without um, impinging on other people's self-ownership. Yeah. What you can, what, what you rightfully own, not what you've taken. Yeah. 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 Um, acquire through trade or homesteading or whatever it happens to be. Or not just, through theft. Or just hard work. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that would fall under the homesteading thing. Okay. That's homesteading just seems like an old term. Yeah. I, yeah. I hear you. Um, and so like, while I, I think that the ideas of, uh, you know, that the philosophy is don't hurt people, don't take their stuff, are helpful to express to people that just completely don't understand. Yeah. It's really simplistic. Um, and because there are situations where we think that it is moral to hurt people or take their stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just not, it's only if they have caused the aggression, though, not you. Yeah. You know? So it, it's not a pacifist philosophy, exactly, yeah. um, where don't hurt people, don't take their stuff sounds like it. But um, if 
you know, it is, we do believe in justice. Yeah. <laughs> which is sadly lacking in the American legal system. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, you, you can defend yourself and you can, and others, and yeah. you can hurt people to do so. There's yeah. a, you know, um, a legitimate understanding that there's a threat. Yeah. And, uh, and then of course, taking people's stuff is, um, in order to settle a, um, an injustice. Yeah. We would think that that was fair. Absolutely. By consensus of some sort. <laughs> yeah. It's th and then, and that's where it falls into <laughs> government things is that, um, you know, you and somebody else that you have a dispute with are probably like often you don't come to an agreement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there needs to be some outside authority and that's where libertarianism ends up being applied to government. But the idea is, um, that, uh, it does as little as possible, essentially keeping, um, peace. Yeah. Like yeah. what's necessary to keep peace. I the, see, the but that way, gets scary the, too, the, because then you end up with like the I robot kind of scenario well, where like, Oh, well the way to keep peace is to lock everybody in their homes, you know? Well, <laughs> it goes, the way I always think of it is, is it's local government. Mm -hmm. And because ultimately, local government will be the most just government. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's what you hope. Well, because they... Because they're accountable they, yeah, to the people exactly. that they people live with. People know them. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, throughout most of history, uh, government wasn't... Um, didn't have rulers. It had leaders. Yeah. Like, when you think about it on a tribal level, a local level, Yeah. Um, there was... Uh, consent was necessary. Yeah. Like, um, leaders had to have the consent of the people yeah. and when they no longer had consent, they were no longer yeah. they, they, giving they, any orders. They were removed one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that's certainly what's missing in modern government. I, and I, I see, you know, obviously we couldn't be a whole bunch of little communities. Yeah. It, it's so hard to apply to this day and to large scale. Yeah. Um, well, that's the whole idea, though, is that it's supposed to be small scale. What? What? I well, think, you, what you need is um, groups that'll band together. There has to be some kind of uh, like a culturally common, um, I don't know, relationship. I guess. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that we mostly have that in this country, although it's fallen apart more and more every day. But you know, initially the states were uh, separate sovereignties. Yeah. Um, but the idea was that we had made an, all these states had made an agreement that if any one of them was attacked, that we would band together to help defend them. Yeah. Kind of like the original idea of NATO. Um, yeah. <laughs> problem you have with NATO now <laughs> is that you have members that pick fights <laughs> <laughs> right. because they expect everybody else to come to their aid because there's a misunderstanding of the, well, and that is part yeah. of the problem when you have any kind of, pack that way yeah um i mean it could work that way here in the u.s too mm -hmm. potentially well the the question is like how small a scale can you go down to and still have the ability to defend against a large sovereignty yeah i mean i think the founders had it right in the beginning with you know you have the states and then like i say it, and we all kind of agreed to take up arms for one another mm -hmm. and i think that's the way to to handle it yeah. Um, the problem is, is that we, we done away with that after the civil war. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Lincoln terrible. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Well, um, that's why I like Lysander Spooner's stuff so much is he spends so much time talking about exactly that. I was going to say he had a really good quote about exactly that. And I don't remember what it was now. Oh, uh, it's definitely not in this notebook. I can go pull it though real quick. It only take me a second. It's on All my right. bookshelf and it's the <laughs> intro. Yeah. So just a moment. All right. You can keep talking to me while I'm looking that up. Um, all right. Gosh, Gary, you can say a single word while that stepped away. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. You could have kept talking about libertarianism. Um, 
You want me to read the whole introduction? It's not really that long. Um, but this is the, yeah, I'm just going to read the whole thing. This is the introduction to uh, No Treason by Lysander Spooner. Um, so the, and what he's addressing is the whether the leaders of the South during the Civil War should be um, uh, prosecuted as treasonous. Okay. Are celebrated as heroes? Well, no, that wasn't the other option at the time. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, he says, The question of treason is distinct from that of slavery and is the same that it would have been if free states instead of slave states had seceded. On the part of the North, the war was carried on not to liberate the slaves, but by a government that had always perverted and violated the Constitution to keep the slaves in bondage and was still willing to do so if the slaveholders could be thereby induced to stay in the Union. The principle on which the war was waged by the North was simply this, that men may rightfully be compelled to submit to and support a government that they do not want, and that resistance on their part makes them traitors and criminals. No principle that is possible to be named can be more self-evidently false than this, or more self-evidently fatal to all political freedom. Yet it triumphed in the field and is now assumed to be established. If it be really established, the number of slaves, instead of having been diminished by the war, has been greatly increased. For a man, thus subjected to a government that he does not want, is a slave, and there is no difference in principle, but only in degree, between political and shadow slavery. The former, no less than the latter, denies a man's ownership of himself and the products of his labor, and asserts that other men may own him and dispose of him and his property for their uses and at their pleasure. Previous to the war, there were some grounds for saying that, in theory at least, if not in practice, our government was a free one, that it rested on consent. But nothing of that kind can be said now, if the principle on which the war was carried on by the North is irrevocably established. If that principle be not the principle of the Constitution, the fact should be known. If it be the principle of the Constitution, the Constitution itself should be at once overthrown. <laughs> That's not the exact one I was thinking of. But that's good. I think it. I kind of think it's kind of in there somewhere. Yeah. yeah, you're. I think. Oh, I just assumed that you were thinking about the part where he says, um, you know, that uh, if the principle has been established that a government can subject people to it that don't want it, then the number of slaves has been greatly increased, increased yeah. rather than diminished. That's the one. Yeah. yeah, that was in there. Yeah, it was in there. No, that's. Um, but that nails it on the head. Like mm -hmm. I say, I mean. Um, yeah, Lysander Spooner is a great read for libertarians trying to find the, the yeah. roots of the principle. Yeah. Um, uh, he's an entertaining writer to me anyway, yeah. too. Uh, it can be a little dry at times, but he's very logical. And, um, if you pay attention, there's a lot of wit in there too. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you're not, you know, lulled to sleep by the droning about <laughs> legal stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's uh, the the idea here, and and the reason that I wanted to talk about um, abortion in this is because we were talking about it the other night, yeah. and there's some disagreement between you and I about what the stance should be on abortion, and I think that that privately we are in agreement, but politically we're not. Yeah, I um, agree with that. And so my you know my private position is that uh, I think that that um, it's the taking of a life and therefore immoral. And I would counsel anybody who asked my opinion of what they should do not to get an abortion. Yeah. Um, well, depending on circumstances. Although, generally speaking, I think I would go with that all the time. Yeah. But there are situations. Anyway, we'll get to that in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Um, <coughs> my political position on it is that there should be no law. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that this is a question, this is a medical question and should be resolved between a doctor and a patient, yeah. um, their family, their God, their conscience, yeah. whatever. Um, that it's not a, not a place for attorneys to decide for them. And my fear of having any laws about it, even um, any kind of restrictions on it, is that they can be misused by law and it puts doctors in a position where they're having to second guess their decisions for concerns about litigation. Yeah. Um, even if their medical opinion is that the best thing here would be an abortion, then they have to also then think about, well, how would a court perceive 
the decision that I'm making? And will it stand up in a court of people that don't understand the medicine? You know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so honestly, I don't disagree with a lot of that. I mean, where I'm at, I, I do think that it's taken a life. And I, I don't know, it's just hard for me to be okay with, with that type of, with, with the, with the government allowing something like we're going to have a government at all, a government allowing something like that to happen. Yeah. Well, and the problem is that we don't have a good definition of life and I'm not comfortable with the, with a bunch of attorneys and government defining creating that definition. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with Um, that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I totally understand that perspective. And so I, uh, I mean, I think that the only thing that we can say without question is that life begins somewhere between conception and birth. Yeah. And I don't know where that is. Nobody does. And no. um, because I think that what you're removing as a life doesn't give me the right to, and this is where the libertarianism part comes in, is that I, I don't have any kind of moral authority over you yeah. in this, over somebody else and their decisions. And it, it's completely immoral for me to use the power of government to impose my idea of the way this works on somebody else. Yeah. No, and all, I think all of that's fair. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with that. And so that's what libertarianism really is. I, I think in the political of, arena is, well, there's a couple of aspects to it. First off, the government doesn't have any rights that any other person doesn't have. Yeah. Um, th- and the rights are, are negative rights. There are no positive rights in the sense that I, I don't have the right to something, I have the right to be free of What about of my right to clean drinking water? Well, uh, if it requires somebody, if you want to go get it yourself. Yeah, then you have a right to it. Then you have a right to it. Yeah. Um, if you think that your right includes your ability to uh, force somebody else to create and provide clean drinking water to you, then you're wrong. You don't have that right. But my right um, to health care, that one is... Legit. Uh, once again, um, if you're trying to conscript doctors or forcing them to do something outside of, of what they um, want to do yeah. uh, within their profession, then nope, absolutely yeah. not. Kamala, you Harris. Can't, Kamala you can't, Harris would hate you. Um, no rights require somebody else to do something on your behalf. Yeah. I mean, and, and so another one that comes up with people is like, well, in the Constitution, you have a, a right to an attorney. Well, yeah, no, it just means that the state can't deny you an attorney, not that you can conscript some attorney to work for you that doesn't want to. Yeah. Well, you're also trying to defend yourself against the government. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's to me, that's how I've always taken that particular one, because that mm-hmm. one does come up a lot. Yeah. Is that, yeah, but like I say, yeah, the government has to provide you an attorney to defend you against them. <laughs> like, that seems well, fair. Well, no, I mean, that's something that came up separately. Is it? Yeah, that's not in the, the Constitution. Original, yeah. yeah, that's that you're you're doing the um, Miranda rights uh, thing, okay. which is separate. That if you can't afford an attorney, one will be provided to you. That's yeah. not part of the constitutional. Yeah, uh, that's not part of the Bill of Rights. It just says that you um, essentially that the government can't deny you representation. Okay. Um, but That's, it doesn't actually require that the government provide you representation the, in the Constitution. But they do, though. Th- they do as part of the Miranda rights. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm, I must have misunderstood how all of that. I thought that was actually in the Constitution. No, no, were... no. It just says that you have a right to counsel. Okay. Right. Um, at, which isn't isn't guaranteeing you counsel. It's just... yeah. Preventing the government from denying you counsel. Yeah. Well, I know that was a problem in, in Great Britain that, that you didn't have, like, mm-hmm. like I say, they could not provide you at all. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I think technically you, they but, could do that still. Yeah. Um, they could not provide you. They just couldn't deny you. I mean, I mean, the actual deny you. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I mean, one of the things that resulted in the separation of the United States and the revolution was that they were taking... Um, people into unfavorable precincts outside of the United States to charge them and yeah. all kinds of stuff. There was, yeah. Um, yeah, there were, there were some legal problems in the colonies. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, but um, the, <coughs> I got totally sidetracked on that. 
<laughs> my bad. Uh, no, it's okay. Um, we'll find our way back. Um, the anyway, the the government, yeah, doesn't have any, doesn't get special treatment. Is part yeah. of the idea. the The government isn't a separate institution that has more rights or more authority, presumably, than any other any other body. Yeah. Um, the idea was that you are collectively giving um, bits of authority that you all had to the government to maintain the society, but not that you, you couldn't give the government a right that any individual didn't have. Yeah. Um, and so the government is not immune from theft. Uh, you know, like it's just as immoral when the government does it as when anybody else does. Absolutely. Which is why taxation is immoral is, is by definition theft. Um, and, uh, the, the other part of that though, um, is that, there's also an immorality for using the power of government to impose a particular philosophy on others. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to only protect those native God given inherent rights of people. Yeah. It's his only purpose. Yeah. One of which is to live. Yeah. Self-ownership. Which, which is the reason that abortion is so Well, important. but you can't prove that that those things are life at any particular point. I mean, it's it's somewhere in there. Yeah, I know. But any <laughs> point that you pick between... Birth and, con, and conception are the only, like, hard points yeah. in this. Yeah. Everything else is a continuum. So any point that you pick in between those two points is necessarily arbitrary. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's a hard pill for me to swallow because mm -hmm. there's definitely a stage there, particularly later term, mm -hmm. where that's absolutely a baby. Yeah, no, I agree. So. I agree. But because you and I agree on that doesn't mean that we get to impose that belief through the power of government onto other people that don't agree. Wow. Well, I mean, is, I, I think that there's. Which is the reason that I think that, that my position, not the the position that has been adopted by the country now mm -hmm. is the right one where you let the states figure it out like and that to me that's the whole sending it back to your local government like mm -hmm. your local government decides or is in the is decides what's what with that yeah. and ultimately and it's a messy process but ultimately the people will make the determine of what's right for their area mm -hmm. um and i don't think it's perfect like i think it's far from it yeah. but i think it's the best you can ask for. I think it's preferable to it being decided at a federal level. Absolutely. Um, at the same time, I prefer the government not be deciding it at all. Yeah. Uh, the, that's, it's a medical question, not a political one. Yeah. Um, that I don't, it I don't be disagree handled with through you that. medical you, professional organizations, et cetera. Yeah. That would be preferable to me. Yeah. I think in the perfect world, that's where I would be too. Um, it's just where... Once again, we're so far from, from anything like that. Um, it's just hard for me to accept that. Well, it's like that issue that Biden brought up in a disastrous way in his State of the Union. Um, the girl in Texas whose uh, fetus had a genetic abnormality where it had a small percentage of surviving to term a small percentage of surviving to through the first year. Um, but it didn't provide any, it, it didn't. Yeah. It wasn't any threat to the life of the mother. Yeah. And so the state <coughs> denied her ability to have an abortion. Yeah. And I don't see any reason why that woman should have to carry that baby to term. It's got very little chance of surviving to term very little chance that like, I think as, as it compounded, it was something like, um, from conception through the first year, the child only had like a 1% chance of survival or something like that. 3%, something like that. Yeah. Um, and it would have, uh, have had some sort of developmental disorder beyond, even if it did survive all that time. Yeah. Um, just because it's no threat to the life of the mother doesn't mean that that woman should be forced to carry that baby i don't think i think that's a reasonable pos reasonable position where even though i think it's a life and all life is valuable and so on yeah that it shouldn't be f she shouldn't be forced 
to follow what I think is the appropriate moral action. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, uh, you know, there's arguments on the left that I have trouble with in terms of like assigning value to life. Like, oh, well, you know, um, if uh, a child's going to, an unwanted child's going to be born into a poor family in a bad neighborhood with poor education. And so what kind of life is that? Like, I have a real problem with that. Uh, like, you know, how can you assign <laughs> value to a life that doesn't exist yet? I mean, to me, um, that's just an argument for forced sterilization as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what you just laid out there. Like, yeah. I mean, if we're going to, I mean, that would be preferable to just aborting them. Well, but maybe you don't, not going to be in that position your whole life, you know? Well, I um, mean, I get all that i'm just saying then you laid out a really strong argument there. <laughs> eugenics all the way that's what this podcast supports that's going to be taken out of context um so uh but at the same time i'm doing the same thing with that scenario yeah. like you got a child with a developmental disorder yeah. um like what kind of life is that going to be what kind of hardship for the family etc yeah. so to a degree i'm doing the same thing yeah. I'm, I'm assigning a lesser value to a life that doesn't exist yet. Um, so I can't get onto them for that, like <laughs> yeah. in order to be consistent. And the other side of that though, is also true where if you, this is why you just can't even have laws about it. It creates problems because on the other side of that, you say, okay, um, you can like an abortion is approved if there's a th if there's a threat to the mother or whatever to the health of the mother. Yeah. Well, I mean, pregnancy itself is a threat to the health of the mother. Yeah. That's when you're getting in front of a court and trying to make an argument. Yeah. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is like I say, I, in in those situations, you're always to me, you always defer to the health of the mother. Like, I mean, if, if it's a choice between the baby or the mother, like I'm taking the mother. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what if, uh, you know, the, this is the second child for the mother and the first one, she had a real severe postpartum depression and tried to commit suicide multiple times. Um, it depends on who's making the decision, but I mean, I, I, that I, I land where I land on that. Like I, I, all of that's an aside as far as I'm concerned. I'm just saying that that there's a reasonable argument there that 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 pregnancy is a threat to the health of the mother. Yeah, yeah, I I, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Um, in the end, I don't think these things should have to be argued in front of a court. I don't think a doctor's decision or the mother's decision really should have to be argued in front of a court. Yeah, like because once again, you're using the power of government to Im impinge on other people's decisions about their own lives. And our whole philosophy is built around their self-ownership and their ability to make their own decisions about their lives. Yeah. I, I just, I have a hard time seeing that put into practice. No, I understand. But yeah. the, the problem is when you're making the law, not when you're not. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. So yeah, being put into practice, the, the problem arises when you create legislation, yeah. not when you don't. Yeah. I mean, for probably the entire history of the world, practically like abortion has been a, um, a look down on, but necessary practice. Yeah. Yeah. It has been around forever. No. Um, women have sought abortions for all sorts of reasons throughout history. And there were people that provided that service. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, they were not really a part of the society. They were on the outskirts, on the edges, the fringes. Yeah. But, um, but it was accepted that this was a thing that had to happen, even if it had a low, um, had essentially no renown, you know, like, yeah. It wasn't publicly supported. Right. Yeah. But they also weren't jailing people for it. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. I mean, there have, those societies have existed <laughs> yeah. obviously too, but yeah. for the most part it was, um, looked down upon, but tolerated. Yeah. And, um, and I, I think that that's kind of where you have to be. Yeah. Like to make society function properly. Yeah. Um, and especially in a modern in an in an age of modern medicine, and I have plenty plenty of criticism of modern medicine 
yeah. in this country. And in fact, like this is a topic that I have really gotten into. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm reading serious adverse events, which is uh, the collection of Celia Farber's articles on the AIDS epidemic. Um, I'm listening to uh, Peter Duesberg's um, book about the creation because this seems like the place really to start, I guess. Um, the creation of the HIV uh, AIDS connection. Okay. Um, y- you know, there's there's a politicization of medicine already in this country, but this is just another this is just another aspect of it. The uh, abortion issue is another politicization of medicine. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think that medicine can be properly practiced when it's politicized. Yeah. I mean, I think that you stop, (coughs) you disrupt that, um, doctor patient relationship. Uh, you disrupt the goal of, um, doing the best for the, uh, for medicine, providing the best possible care for the party that they're providing care for. Um, I think that if you, um, interrupt that relationship with legislation, you just create more problems. Yeah. Like yeah. most things. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's kind of what government does. Yeah. Um, Whether it's abortion or hurricane aid. Yeah. <laughs> Foreign policy. Foreign yeah. policy. Like, yeah. yeah. Name, name um, a category where the government exceeds. Yeah. I mean, that's the, yeah, that is the disaster of foreign policy is that they're, they're looking to benefit particular groups. Um, with abortion, it's more like, uh, um, vote harvesting is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, like appease whatever group so that you can be reelected. Yeah. Um, there's no morality to the decision at all. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's true in foreign policy too. It's, that's also, it's, it's seeking election help, but it's seeking election help through money instead of votes in that yeah. case. Like yeah. you're not getting more votes by, you know, um, enriching, uh, government military contractors. Um, but you are, um, giving money that will cycle back around into your campaign. <laughs> I was going to say, you're going to, all the, a portion of that money you're giving them, you're going to see back. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And you're just taken from us and, you know, collectively we're all paying just a small percentage, which is, actually a lie, like literally a quarter of what I give to the government every year goes to military stuff. <laughs> what they're grumming. Yeah. Um, Lockheed Martin. That's the one that I can never remember their name. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I'm so bad at that one. It's, it's <laughs> such a great example though. Yeah. I don't know. We've kind of droned on probably long enough. Um, I hope this was interesting. We didn't have anything really prepared because neither of us had time to do anything (laughs) this week it's been a long week so sorry if it wasn't but i think it probably was we talked about some interesting stuff right yeah i mean this like these subjects are definitely interesting and sometimes it's good to kind of get back to the roots yeah Um, well i wish i'd had had set myself at least like a little outline of how i wanted to talk about libertarianism i just yeah. But I didn't, so it was a little disjointed, and so we ended up. We kind of, yeah, I drug you down a few. Right yeah, the holes. and ended up just kind of being topical. I'm glad yeah. I got to read the introduction to No Trees, and I think once again <laughs> on yeah. the podcast because this one of the, it's one of my favorite little bits of writing about government, anyway. Yeah. Um, and the adjustment from a federal system to a centralized government. Yeah. Uh, which is what happened after the Civil War. Yeah. We we went from we completely abolished the idea that the states had freely entered a contract and could freely leave. Yeah, exactly. So that was, I, I, that was a system that worked. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it it did did result in the civil war. (laughs) Yeah. Only because the North said no. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if they They could have let it be, if the North had just been like, all right, the South wants to be the South. We're going to let let them be Mm -hmm. like, we'd be living in a completely different society. That's certainly true. Um, I still don't think we'd have slavery at this point. That's the point I was fixing to make though, is we wouldn't have slavery. Slavery was already on the way out anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was this, the whole idea that the civil war was absolutely, it was about states rights. Like Mm -hmm. that's what it was. So, um, slavery was an important aspect of that though. Was. We can't discount that. No, um, but 
to, I mean, to, if think you, that, to think that if the North had just let the South be and we became two separate countries, that we would still be using slavery today is just like just an insane thought. It I just I, I kind of feel like it would probably have been excuse me would have ended up kind of like North and South Korea in reverse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, where the South would be completely impoverished and the North yeah. would be uh, wealthy, a wealthy country. You think so? Mm-hmm. You think it's that much different now? No, but I think it would be <laughs> I mean, um, exaggerated. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think the South was already poorer than the North because they were, because they were reliant on a slave economy. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that that, those differences would have um, have continued to increase even beyond the point where the South got rid of slavery, which I think that they would have eventually done. Yeah. Um, I don't even think it would have taken that long, honestly. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, I, I would say certainly by the the beginning of the 20th century, I say certainly. I feel confident that by the beginning of the 20th century, slavery would have ended anyway. Yeah. So we're only talking about another 35 years. Yeah. Um, a lot of damage can be done in 35 years for sure. But yeah. uh, I, I think that um, even from that point to now, that probably the South would ha- wouldn't have come close to making up the difference. I think yeah. that we've made up more of a difference in the South by being a part of a single country than yeah. we otherwise would have. Maybe, but I mean, you've got to think though, we would have been a lot freer down here than the North would have been. Yeah. I mean, look at like, um, I don't know. Would we have? Maybe. I mean, I would think so. I mean, I think we are still. By, by nature, we are. I mm-hmm. mean, by nature, the South just embraces freedom more than the North. Now, I don't know that that would have necessarily played into the politics the way I, the way I'm assuming it would. Yeah. But, but I kind of feel like it would. Well, I, maybe we would have made up a lot of difference after the abolition of slavery then. Um, just by, I mean, there is a, a real emphasis on resourcefulness yeah. down here, but there's also like a cultural laziness. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how much I've like you've I've heard you say that before. I don't know. Think of I mean it, it's not that it doesn't exist in the north too, but um I th- I think that on the average you're much more likely to come across a person in the south that works only when they need money for something specific. Yeah. than in the north. I think oh. that there's a general industriousness in the north that that there are plenty of people that have in the South, but yeah. that the percentages are skewed. Yeah. I mean, maybe. Um, I mean, there's definitely, I don't know. To me, and this is just like, I've nothing really to back this up, but it just seems like down here in the South, like we have more of a priority on family and community that just doesn't, that isn't the same as what goes on in the North. Well, that may be true. But there's also... But, but with that comes some of that, you know, well, I'm going to do what I need to to get by mm-hmm. and make sure that I've got enough time to take care, to to enjoy the time with my family versus I'm going to work myself into a, a stupor. Yeah, but you also see that with people that don't have families. Well, that, okay. I mean, there is some <laughs> of that, yeah. It's just a slower way of life. Yeah. I'm not trying to make a moral judgment on it. Yeah. Um. But I think that the result is that uh, that the North would have advanced and created more wealth than the South would have. Now, yeah. it could have worked the other way, though. I mean, it's it's certainly possible that just like the general um, liberty of uh, Southerners to solve <laughs> their problems would have resulted in some innovations. I mean, there are a lot of great inno- innovations that came out of the South, yeah. mostly to deal with the heat. I mean, yeah, refrigeration, right. air conditioner, like these yeah. are Southern inventions. Yeah. Um, there was a real need. Somebody figured <laughs> something out. Like, I do think that yeah. there's a, there's an emphasis on resourcefulness down here that, that doesn't exist in the North. Um, but there's also just like a kind of a slower way of approaching life. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, dealing with life as a set of necessities rather than, um, just like working all the way through whether you need it or not. Yeah. There's a, a, a story in, um, it's Thomas soul book. Is it, um, what's the, it's the, um, white rednecks and no, no, I don't remember whatever that book is called. I know what book you're talking about. Rednecks and liberals, something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, black rednecks and white. I don't know. Anyway, whatever the hell it's called. (laughs) Uh, There's a story in there where there's a guy talking about um, his travels through the North and the South. And he says, you know, if, uh, uh, and some farmland in the North, um, I think he's talking essentially about the Midwest in this particular case, like the Northern Midwest, um, Ohio, Illinois, whatever, that kind of area. Yeah. Which is a lot of German settlement, which also has something to do with it. I mean, we're talking about cultural traits here. Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, somebody has a farm and they've got a, a river that, that bisects the farm in some way. He's like, they'll get a, people out there, neighbors and so forth, and they'll um, create a bridge over that river within a, a couple of days. And then in the South, with a similar situation, that that farmer will, will ford that river every day of his life for 20 years and never build a bridge. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the... The conclusion there really in that book um, is that uh, black rednecks, white liberals. I think that that's it. Anyway, that's right. Yeah. Um, that these cultural traits that came over from Europe have a big impact. Yeah. So the, you know, th- there was the like Max Weber Protestant work ethic idea that came over with the Germans. And so they're just industrious generally yeah. uh, as a culture already. And they brought that culture over to the United States with them. Um, and the South was peopled mostly, uh, with folks on the fringes. Um, so Irish and, um, Scottish peoples and that were just had a different approach to life that essentially was about, wasn't so industrious. That was about like getting by, playing around, enjoying yourself, not all that other stuff. Oh. And that that's become a part of the culture. And I mean, I see it. Yeah. I know where you live. You can't say that you don't see it too. <laughs> oh, I know where I live. <laughs> I'm in the thick of it where I'm at. <laughs> exactly. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it's not to say that there aren't people that work hard down here. It's just that on the average, if you, you know, took a hundred people from the Northern Midwest and a hundred people from rural Alabama, yeah. Taking rural places in in both cases. Yeah. That that on the average, probably those hundred people from the Midwest, from Ohio, rural. Yeah. Are going to work harder. Yeah. Maybe. And be more willing to work and yeah. work every day. Yeah. Whereas the guys in the South are like, well, I got a bill to pay, so let me do a couple of jobs. Yeah. So I have enough money to pay that bill. And then I'm going to sit at home and watch Jerry Springer for a couple of weeks till I got another bill due. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I think that's less and less as people move around the country. The, there's more mixing, but there's still like, there's still a part of that just kind of lazy Southern culture that exists. Yeah. You say lazy, I say laid back. <laughs> Same difference. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, I, like I'm not all on board with the industriousness for industriousness sake. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I work, but I like to, I like to relax and do nothing too. Yeah. Or I, I would have gotten farther. <laughs> like a, like a true Southerner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would have gotten farther in life. I mean, like I can't, you know, mm-hmm. I can't bring myself to do work that I want to do sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, all right. Well, <laughs> we may as well wrap up there on our, yeah. Um, definitely self-assessment. On, <laughs> I was gonna say definitely went on a bit of a tangent with that one. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's all right. We didn't have anything to talk about today, anyway. <laughs> there you go. So uh, back to normal, though. Now, right? I hope. I mean, so. as much as possible. Like, I mean, I'm. I don't have anything fixed that's going to cause a problem later this week, but well, problems keep 
tend to find me right now. No, so. <laughs> no, I get it. And like with Milton, it, I we could be buried. We could very well be at a point where I'm working 100 hours a week for weeks yeah. on end too. So well, we'll have to see. But I will do my absolute level best to not be lazy and <laughs> get a podcast. Get a out. podcast out no matter mm. what. Um, so we gotta, the plan, we, gotta, we gotta get your your podcast on the medical stuff you're like digging into, right? Uh, well, I talked about some of that a few weeks ago, the one I did on my own oh, um, when you were out of town. That's right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm just saying, but you're that, no, that's just become an interest though. Now, like now, yeah. I'm in it. I'm yeah. like, I'm, I'm uh, reading may, and reading. I feel and like reading. we may need a follow up. <laughs> well, we might. We might. I'm certainly gathering more information. It's how much of it sticks and whether it's worthwhile to get into the minutia. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's some, there's some really important topics and that does feel like it's one of them. So, yeah. I mean, there's certainly some real strong parallels that I, I, like, I hope I was able to identify for people between the, um, public health reaction to the AIDS crisis and the public health reaction to the COVID. Oh yeah. Uh, stuff. So (laughs) for one, the figurehead was the same. Well, yeah, that (laughs) that's, that's true, but he's gone now. He is gone now. And has been replaced by one of his uh, um, principal investigators. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. N- no, no, no. The, the principal investigators that do the vaccine trials and so forth. Oh, okay. Yeah, gotcha, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Not somebody that was investigating him. Okay. That, that was getting I, I, I paid took that, by I took him. that wrong. No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> that was getting paid by him to do investigations into pharmaceuticals. Okay. Okay. So one of his underlings then. Yeah. Okay. More or less. Um, somebody who knows the racket, that's for sure. Hey, there you go. And that's what really matters in yeah. the end. I don't think she's changing anything. Yeah. Um, she's been enriched and she knows how to enrich others. Hey, there you go. Uh, on the taxpayer dime. Because yeah. that's the key to government. <laughs> <laughs> Just to hit that one more time before we go. All yeah. right. So we'll be back next week as the plan. Um, maybe odd times or hours <laughs> or whatever. We'll just... We'll have to see, but we'll figure it out. Um, and uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on... If, if you want to know when we post, <laughs> you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or Podbean. Um, that'll let you know when we have something new up. And uh, yeah, like and subscribe and comment. And you can always me- email me at michael at thelibertymike.com. And, uh, yeah, that's all the stuff I think. So, um, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.